Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Ancient names are by far the biggest determining factor of identity and fate in saving the region of Natlan. Of course, I'm not talking about ancient names only, but rather the mementos that carry the 500-year memories and plans of past heroes that helped to save Natlan. But to be honest, they didn't actually save Natlan during the Cataclysm either. It was a two-part solution that kept the Abyss at bay while also preparing for an overarching plan to completely remove it. So, if we're going to understand the entirety of ancient names, sacred flames, and the Night Kingdom, then we first need to understand the importance of Revival, a plan that required both the return of the Pyro Archon and the reignition of the six heroes of each tribe. This was decided by Mavuika, which should have been ready to be enacted the moment she came back. But what actually happened is that the Night Kingdom was invaded by the Abyss, thereby preventing their plan to be enacted. So in this video, I'll be explaining to you the importance of memories in Netland, the Night Kingdom and its transparent flame, the unique ancient names which carry the 500-year plan, as well as a closer look at Mavuika and Capitano's battle for the new age and the cleansing light of the Traveler. This video covers the entire 5.0 Archon quest in detail, so if you want to know the details of Mambuika's room, the Spirit Seeker Stone, and Molani's tribe in the Abyss, then I'll also explain it here. So let's set our hearts ablaze, shall we? Ancient names are, at its core, a means of connection to someone's soul through Natland's past heroes while the Pilgrimage and the Night Warden Wars carve the way to the future, given by the Wyubs to those whose natural traits are etched into their existence, as mentioned by Mawika, kind of like a title that best fits and describes them for who they truly are. But in terms of abilities, they already have those worthy of the name, and they use these skills very much naturally. Ancient Names not only gives you renown and the ability to be revived when you die, but it's also a means for the next generation to continue the heroes' stories. Think of a pile of wood used in a campfire to tell stories and turned into coal. Then the next person using that charcoal would then make their own fire and tales. To put this into perspective, Kachina's name Utabiti means resilience, and it was chosen for her by the Wyub because she was already resilient in nature. So in a sense, she only needed to improve her resilience as Kachina rather than proving that Kachina is resilient, if you understand the way I'm phrasing it. The Night Kingdom also knows the past and future of Natlan, so they already know the fates of people and which ancient names belongs to whom. Another good example is Molani. We only found out about her name Umoja, meaning unity near the end, but she was showcasing this unity by being determined to save her friend Kachina, helping her tribe, and even Atea. Finally, we have Kanich with Malipo meaning payment, which is quite funny. Using a more logical approach and weighing the costs of better outcomes, as well as charging every single thing he does. As a side note, ancient names are also called Tokaito, translated to name, with themes of children and adolescents. What I mean to say is that ancient names are a sort of calling that an individual is already born with, simply given the appropriate title to guide them in improving themselves. The right to be revived is honestly just a cherry on top, and it's possible that everyone can be revived with enough power. If we look at it from outside of Netland, it's very much similar to how visions, fates, and constellations work. But instead of a fated event for Celestia's plan, it's a fated title and role given to those who have the inborn ability to protect Netland. This passing down of personal traits and roles, as we've seen from Simulanka and Clorin's story, also has a wider meaning for the entirety of Natlan and for Mavuika's 500-year plan. While on the topic of ancient names, a certain handful of ancient name bearers were included in Mavuika's plan, and four of them have in a sense had an awakening that is specific to what we can call their unique names. Unique name bearers like Kenich having Malipo, Shilonen, the one responsible for forging out our ancient name, Yansen from the tribe of Plenty, and now Molani with Omoja are all specifically chosen, inheriting the memories of ancient name bearers included in the 500-year plan. With regards to character rarity, we can possibly expect that those included in the six special names are five-star characters, with Mavuika as the Archon completing the seven elements of Natland's heroes. Something interesting that I've noticed about obsidian carvings and ancient names is the use of abyssal lettering. We know that phlogiston engravings are linked to the Wyab of each tribe and that the Wyabs choose who get these. 
so there might be a connection between the Abyss and Netland through the Wyobs. Some of the ruins in Netland also use the ancient civilization design, of which both utilize a glowing tower and both Netland and Enkanomiya call this the Sun. But bear in mind that this is only from the 5.0 Archon quest and I just thought that it was worth mentioning. The Sacred Flame of Natlan is very much tied to the Night Kingdom and Fate. But as mentioned by Mavika, elemental energy and its own war with the Abyss also dates back to times older than the Pyro Archon, the realm of sovereign dragons, who once had an incredibly advanced civilization within Natlan. Today, the Sacred Flame for Humanity is not just a place of memory, but a cornerstone of Natlan's culture and striking fear into the Abyss. Mavika is one such example, who placed herself in the Sacred Flame before she could die of old age, and then returning during their planned reunion time with the six heroes, finally it's where the memories of the past heroes flow. As of patch 5.0, we also know that Mavika placed all her power into the Sacred Flames after her fight with Capitano. What this all means is that every Natlanian that ever lived and died became part of the Sacred Flame and has been resurrecting in the present in a certain way through the ancient names. Now as for this white flame at the end of the Archon quest, the Scions of the Canopy might have called this the Turnfire, a transparent intense flame responsible for the revival of Natlanian heroes. Mawika and the past heroes would also refer to it as the Sun, capable of burning cities black. Today it seems like only Mavika can stare into this fire and not be burned as the Pyro Archon. It also seems to be the essence of pure Pyro energy within Natlan, of which we should have had as the Traveler, but that can't happen unless we save Natlan first and take away the Abyss. The Pilgrimage of the Sacred Flames Return is the classic tournament style format to find the best warriors both physically and mentally. This is all in preparation for the Night Warden Wars, which take the winners of the pilgrimage and fight against the Abyss. It's not explicitly mentioned where this war takes place, but based on the attacks on Mualani's tribe, the wars likely occur at night and are conducted somewhere within Natlan. A possible hint is that this scene from the trailer hasn't been shown yet and might be where the Night Warden Wars happen. What this means is that there's a deeper relation with the Night Kingdom and Natlan. We can see this during the Spirit Speaker Stone mission, combining real tangible objects in Natlan with intangible memories in the Night Kingdom. It emphasizes merging planes of existences, eras, timeframes, and memories together, which I'm sure you've already noticed from the previous segments. In our time with Mavika, she speaks of the past, present, and future as if it's in the same time frame, and that it is the true shape of time. This reflects the 500 year plan for Natlan's survival, stopping the past from happening, fighting in the present, and then reaching their desired future. So by the end of it, all three time frames will converge into the current and Natlan will finally be free from the abyss. When it comes to remembering something or someone, physical items or mementos are always better for keeping memories and stories. But for the people of Natlan, those memories serve as a source of power. In a deeper sense that is applicable to Natlan and its people, it's very similar to ancient names. Mementos store the memories that serve as fuel for not just keeping the sacred flame alive, but also to produce pyro energies, which again loops back to everything else I've mentioned. Memories and stories are what drive Natlan's people, and it's also what gives their archons power. Using all of the mementos together to break a hole into the Night Kingdom can more or less serve the same purpose as feeding those mementos into the sacred flame. In a land without any gods at all, and where strong memories are what keeps them together, Together, it's only natural that their stories be so grand and that they keep those stories along with their ancient names so close. Sadly, we don't get to see those mementos anymore and even Movika's photo isn't there. There's also a fun reference to Hunter x Hunter if you did notice. Moolani and Atea's segment describes their ongoing war with the Abyss, highlighting how it deeply affects the people of Natlan. The Night Kingdom, which functions as the ley lines of the region, stores Natlan's memories and futures. Wyobs from each tribe can access this past and future, but the Abyss's invasion of the Night Kingdom allows it to manipulate these memories, tailoring the constant abyssal attacks to each tribe. Atea, for example, suffers internal corrosion that prevents her from enjoying the hot springs 
lives with her companions, with her condition worsening if she enters the hot spring. While the traveler's ability to cleanse the abyss is not exactly new and may not be entirely unique either. As a descender, the traveler, Lumine or Aether, possesses immunity to the abyss, functioning like a water purifier. However, the process might be more akin to an annihilation of opposing energies rather than a simple cleansing and removal. The abyss, much like an impure chaotic ocean water, collides with the traveler's pure energy and are both nullified. While the traveler can stop for their corrosion using this colliding of both elements, the damage that is already done, like Atea's condition, cannot be reversed. This cancellation of powers mirrored the Numa and Osha of Fontaine, and especially the event quest of Enkanomiya's Triangle Gateway Offering. And now we have Natlan's Obsidian Pillars, the Celestial Nails, and the Travelers all helping to cancel out the Abyss, resulting in the phenomena you see here. The ancient ruins within Natlan also suggest a connection to the civilizations like Enkanomiya and the Chasm, which further connects them to the dragons long ago and the first humans within Tevat. It's worth noting that only ancient name bearers can be revived and that 500 years ago, warriors without ancient names still fought despite that. So it's more than just a name. But today, the Ode of Resurrection fails for the first time ever because the Abyss has gradually taken control of the Night Kingdom, halts the revival process, which then reveals other problems related to it. Together, these events cause the Sacred Flame to die out, leading to the eventual destruction of Natlan. However, that's not really my main focus here. I wanted to actually highlight the lyrical symbolism and overarching theme of Natlan's Ode of Resurrection that Mavrika speaks of at the end of the quest. Growing alongside sun and wind, possibly tying back to Venti from the manga, and forging destinies through fire and blood, a notion that is also referenced in the teaser. The Pyro Archon's role, stepping into the sacred flame to reunite with the heroes, reflects the current six tribes and their awakened heroes, then ending with the audience's chant for revival. The repetition of the words once again added some depth to the ceremony that honestly made me tear up a bit. The battle between Mavuika and Capitano reveals his knowledge about Natlan's past and his own solutions for its future. Capitano might also be an ancient name bearer and his ancient name might honestly be righteousness. It's been hinted at by his fellow Harbingers and Varka and even himself by waltzing into the stadium for a duel instead of sneaking around like other Harbingers do. He already knows about the 500 year plan of which should only be known to a select group of people within Natlan, mentioning an unfulfilled oath 5 centuries ago and it's also where the Gnosis is first mentioned. It's even highlighting the traditional tales of Natlan where heroes in time of crisis pick up the mantle of salvation. The rules that Capitano is talking about is the framework that allow ordinary people to become Archons, and giving them the appropriate powers while also awakening their own inner flame. Not to mention the voices of the past saying rules as his legacy, hinting at either a previous Pyro Archon or even the rules of a Pyro Dragon. Now we know of Shbalanke, the one entombed in Primal Fire, but it's possible that Shbalanke was a human instead. Moving on, at the end of their battle, Mavika could easily dispel the fog caused by Capitano's accomplice. But she chose not to since she noticed an unusual presence within Capitano. Speculatively speaking, if Capitano is indeed from Natlan, then the fire mark on his person might not be from Mavika's fire, but an inner flame leaking out of his cold exterior shell, much like Senora's crimson flames. At the end of the quest, we can see him speaking to who we can only assume is Ororon. Now, as as for what Ororon heard, it's probably related to his ancient name, which is to hear, similar to his origin Oro, meaning to hear or resonate. The Abyss invading the Night Kingdom allows it to do everything I've mentioned. The war with the Abyss 500 years ago drove them underground and infecting the Wyob halts the Ode of Resurrection. As they are responsible for handing out ancient names, they are also responsible for helping revive its bearers. The communication with the Wyob and the Sacred Flame was also blocked by the Abyss. Now if the group hadn't saved the Wyob, then that proxy totem would have been lost forever, which would be followed by abyssal events in Kachina's tribe. It's worth noting that not all the souls that you see here are actual souls of Natlan. 
Malco is an actual soul while the ones looking like the chasm's ghosts are manifestations of abyssal power. Abyssal creatures are physically manifested as saurians, humans, and mental attacks like whispers for living beings trapped there. We also have info about the unique creatures like the lectors. Malco specifically calls it an embodiment of abyssal power, which is the same powerful monster that was chasing Kachina. Finally, the six main totem poles and their proxies that reach all the souls of the Night Kingdom. Only one proxy was shown but there are countless ones all over the realm. The Wyobs, interestingly, are called Agents of Night's Will, hinting at a Lord of the Night, which Kenich mentioned when he uses his ultimate, as well as the Abyssal Wall in the Night Kingdom being similar to the one in the Golden Slumber Quest in Sumeru. I've already discussed everything that Mavika has to say at the end of the quest, all except for Vanessa. Now, Mavika says that the people of Netland are all tied to the Wyobs, the Night Kingdom, and inextricably the Abyss for possibly more than 500 years. Ancient names are made with abyssal letters, and the approval of a Wyob is needed to be able to leave. As for Netlanians that do leave their region, even with the Wyob's approval, they would still have emotional and mental effects similar to those who were afflicted by the Abyss. A possible case is Vanessa's tribe, who might have had the approval of their Wyob and have lost their memories after leaving. There is also the theory that they are the flame-touched pyro tribe that left long ago, but there's still no info on that. And so that's everything in the 5.0 Archon Quest explained. As of editing this video, I'm currently finishing the World Quests and Chronicles, so expect more explained videos like this for those as well. But the next video is going to be the lore on the 6 tribes of Netlan, and I mean all 6 tribes even though we've only had 3, but I've yapped about a lot of things already so I'll end the video here. As always, like comment if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!